Eric Orwell uh, kindly left a rather detailed response as a comment to my uh, video response to his video. <laughs> um, um, and uh, regarding master and slave, or as he put it actually, master race and empire. Um, and I really enjoy arguments like this, or debates like this, or discussions like this, um, because they have to do with absolute value, or quality. Uh, remember Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Um, now, I'm going to discuss this. Now, before we be even begin, you know, I want to make something very clear. Um, I'm not doing, I'm not criticizing or deconstructing Mr. Orwell's arguments from a Marxist or cultural Marxist point of view or modern mealy mouth liberal. I would ask anyone who wants to actually look into what I'm actually saying to from the very beginning disabuse themselves of all such notions. Let's just stick to the actual discussion of what is at hand here. Um, this is a discussion that is very easy to derail. Um, it leads quickly, as we might uh, see from other discussions of this sort, to things like shouting matches and recriminations. Um, and in line with my sort of disavowal of um, cultural Marxism or whatever you want to call it, let me say something right off the hop here. I do not believe in human equality. Okay, I'm staring right into the camera when I say that because I want to really underline that point. Um, nor do I believe um, in racial comparisons of any kind. Um, not because I believe that all humans should be considered equal based on their merits. Um, I don't believe that because I don't believe that merits are things you can actually pinpoint. Um, and I'm pretty darn skeptical of modern theories of the existence of races. Now, um, with that in mind, again, I do not believe in human equality, at least in the way that the terms the term is normally used. Here is Mr. Orwell's response. One, there exist moral frame frameworks that improve the general welfare and facilitate social and technological process uh, progress. I'm sorry, I'm not myself today. I have a throat cold and a head cold and a chest cold, but anyway. I really like this discussion, so I'll soldier on. Now, first point, there exist moral frameworks that improve the general welfare and facilitate social and technological process, progress. This I would like to look into first and foremost. Improve the general welfare. Now that's an interesting argument because general welfare is something that I've debated at length for a very long period of time with other people on a completely different, um, from a completely different angle. What is the general welfare? I would like to see how we would define that. Can we say that somebody who's more technologically advanced has a better general welfare than someone who isn't? Um, that's an interesting discussion. You would think that it does because people who don't have high technology, they don't have the ability to feed a large number of people over you know, using a comparatively small amount of resources, i.e. a piece of land. If you know how to scientifically farm, you're going to get a lot more than if you scratch farm or subsistence farm or whatever. Uh, if you have efficient farming, you can produce more. That way, people are less likely to starve, etc., etc. Okay, that I think is pretty unarguable. But is that absolutely how we are going to decide, uh, define general welfare and social and technological progress? I'm not sure about that. For example... Um, as I say, it looks unarguable that the scientifically or 
industrially or technologically advanced um, group are absolutely better off than those who aren't. Okay, freeze frame it to say 1850. Okay, now look at somebody living in the Bowery in New York, New York's Lower East Side at that point, and shoot west a couple of hundred miles and look at somebody wandering around on the open prairie hunting buffalo, bison. Who's better off? The guy living in the industrial slum or the guy wandering around in the open air? That's one objection. You can you can have that objection writ large all you want. Um, I don't think that technological advancement automatically means a better life. In some ways it does, in some ways it does not, or in some ways it's neutral, in some ways you really can't tell. Um, you know, we get highly technologically advanced civilizations like Nazi Germany, which people generally assume were not desirable things to have visited on the human race. Now, I don't want to get into that because, again, that looks like it's the sort of argument that's going to lead to, you know, finger pointing and name calling. Suffice it to say, I don't think that there is one way to define general welfare, nor is there one way to define progress. Um, I had an interesting argument on progress just concerning this guy that popped his cork in um, Fort Lauderdale the other day and killed a bunch of people. I just said, okay, let's discuss the Second Amendment here and see what's going to happen um, if we don't change the way we look at things or whatever. Uh, Fifty years from now, a hundred years from now, what lethal technologies are we going to or is each individual going to be able to carry around in his or her pocket and are, you know, virtually undetectable? Um, what are the technologies going to allow us to do with these new force multipliers that will come along? Can we say that then that techno techno technological progress is an absolute um, advancement, an absolute benefit? Because do we really want a civilization in which everybody has the ability to commit mass murder to have mini WMDs in their pockets at all time and act on them with no restraints whatsoever. Do we really want that? Because if our if technology is better, how do you address the fact that technology can kill billions of people? You know, it's it's not as simple as we might think it is. I'm not saying that it, technology is bad, but what I'm saying is you've got to be able to look at it from different angles all the time when you're dealing with axioms here. And the first statement, there exist moral frameworks that improve the general welfare and facilitate social and technological progress. That's an axiom. And I think that most of us agree with it until you really, truly deconstruct it. And then the sort of gaps appear. It takes a while, but they do inevitably appear. We can sort of say, okay, there are exceptions to this axiom, which is why it's an axiom and not a fact. You see the similarities to other arguments I've made here on YouTube. Now, second statement, societies which find those frameworks that lead to more highly felicitous states will have a comparative advantage over those societies which fail to find socially productive mores. Advantage. What advantage? I, I'd like to sort of see what you mean by an advantage. An advantage in terms of competition over what? competition over resources, over over territory, over whatever. Assuming, of course, that that's all that life is, <clears throat> is a competition over resources, a competition over scarcity, a competition for food, a competition for, I don't know, breeding partners, whatever. If you ask me, that's a misreading of Darwin. It's a misreading of natural selection. It's a misreading of evolution itself. <clears throat> And it also seems to assume that there is such a thing as Society A and Society B, which I'm not sure I agree with 100 percent. It's on, they only agree they, they on, these two societies only exist because we agree that they exist, and they have members that identify as Group A and Group B. Uh, we and they. Now we and they are not absolutes. We can say that we and they pop up all the time. Yes, I won't deny that. It looks pretty obvious, pretty axiomatic. But at the end of the day, there is a great deal of one's life that one lives absolutely alone, no matter what you think um, you belong to, what group you think you belong to. 
Have you ever felt like you were completely alone, surrounded by your peers? I bet everyone on YouTube here has had that feeling before. All these people that I'm supposed to have something in common with, I don't get along with at all. I have an Israeli friend who likes to joke about how much Israelis actually can't stand each other, which is kind of an exaggeration, but it's just, you know, he, he likes to say that Israelis like to argue with each other all the time, and um, very fractious and quarrelsome people, um, and yet they will stick together like glue because they've learned the hard way that they have to. Um, now, does that really mean that that's a society that feels itself to be an absolute group with absolute values that hold at all times? No, it doesn't. It means that these people feel compelled to stick together in some ways. In other ways, they, of course, they do feel like they're a member of a group, by the way. But when it comes to each person dealing with the individual in front of them, they often don't get along very well at all. Watch how things get debated in the Israeli parliament or watch a animated discussion in an Israeli coffee house. Um, I've never been to Israel, but I've been to Greece, and it's the same sort of idea. Scream, shout, yell, um, wave your arms around, etc., and everyone is actually having a great time, but it's just, that's how it, this works. And Greeks also have been known to turn on each other with incredible violence. If you've ever read about the Greek Civil War in the late 1940s, there's a civil war for you. There's a horrible situation to be in. The ancient Greeks had a word for that, stasis, which meant everybody against everybody else. Um, that was Greece in the 19, late 1940s. Arguably, it started even before the Second World War ended. Anyway, the issue is, do societies exist absolutely, or do they exist because they're the people that make them up believe that they exist? Does the group ab absolutely exist or in all contexts, or does it not? For example, um, I come from one society. My wife comes from a completely different society. We chose to marry each other and beget children. What society do we belong to now? That's another interesting curve where I, where the cultural Marxism bit comes in. Um, but you know, that's I'd like to sort of avoid that kind of discussion because it's it's an interesting cultural Marxism aspect or the, someone who is deliberately weakening our civilization by causing us to amalgamate with others or by amalgamating with others is sort of a conspiracy theory that sort of says that's why this theory that Eric Orwell is making doesn't actually pan out in real life because some people are cheating. don't really want to go down that road yet, but I know that it's there. So I'm not really sure that I believe that societies exist in all, exist in all contexts. Um, again, if we're going to talk about societies or species, um, species apparently can't crossbreed. Human societies certainly can. Um, <clears throat> what does what what does uh, he mean when he says societies which fail to find socially productive mores? What's a socially productive more? Is it one that facilitates survival? Is it one that facilitates safety, security, um, affluence, etc.? Okay, then we are going to say then that, that the end game of human existence is safety, security, and affluence, etc., which, again, I'm not a hedonist. I don't believe that being alive is an end in itself. I don't believe, I'm not convinced that um, becoming rich is an end in itself, or finding comfort, or finding security, or finding um, whatever is an end in itself. Not at all. Um, that, I think, is one of the more Nietzschean aspects of my thinking. I simply don't see it that way at all. Um, <clears throat> the end, the end of human existence, is to be found in the individual. Um, all the stuff out there is just us coping with reality. There's no progress in that. There's just the only progress there is is on a completely and strictly human individual level. Um, everything else is stuff that we, I think, we just have to cope with. I'd like to have that discussion too. <clears throat> Three, those societies, quote unquote, master races. I understand the term has negative connotations, and I use it specifically to challenge prevailing sentiments against hierarchy and authority. Okay, fair enough. I'm not going to jump all over him for saying master races, which find productive moral slash legal systems will come to influence those societies which do not. 
which do not, sorry, either through conquest annexation or through the diffusion of beneficial social and physical technologies. Now you see how quality is creeping into this, good and bad, or productive and unproductive, etc. Again, I've been arguing this for a very long time. I'm not sure that I agree that there is such a thing as absolute progress or um, that certain behavior is absolutely productive. It might be absolutely productive as we go along, but then suddenly something will come along that says, uh-oh, maybe that wasn't so productive. I mentioned um, weapons technology, which may end up doing us in as a species, and you can sort of say, okay, how does that, how does the fact that, say, we blow ourselves up with some huge UMD, a WMD, how does that fit into ideas of progress? Again, you have to sort of say, okay, maybe then somebody misused it. Well, yeah, but that's doesn't matter. It, we are, as humans, we are part of the equation. And if somebody misuses it, then that's as much a reflection on the technology itself as it is on the human beings. Because we are ultimately discussing human beings here, not technology in and of itself. <clears throat> productive moral legal systems. Productive of what? What does it mean to be productive? What does it mean to be productive? You produce more and more stuff. Well, then, okay, there are the obvious objections to that. There's affluenza, where, you know, obesity and diabetes and all that sort of thing of, of having too much and lethargy and not enough challenges or whatever keeps you unhealthy. Um, but that's kind of a silly one, a pop culture-ish one, this idea of affluenza. But there's the other one. There's the technology trap. Okay, you've got a productive moral-slash-legal system okay, based on technology, but that technology is based upon a whole bunch of things, um, and it gets a little bit precarious when you start to look at it. Um, like, for example, look at how, quote-unquote, advanced we are now in terms of communication technologies on the planet. It's not inconceivable that somebody would come up with a super germ, i.e., um, a super computer virus, and, I don't know, somehow crash the world's internet. I don't know how you could do that. I really don't understand how these technologies work. But let's say that everything gets more and more plugged in with everything else. Everything becomes more and more um, digitalized or automated or whatever. And somebody just finds out, or there is a weakness in this that people don't see, and the system crashes of its own sort of, um, simply because there are flaws that were built into it at the very beginning and only appeared these flaws only appeared when it was too late for us to do anything about it. It's addiction to technology. You know how that works. You get used to things being the same for so very long that you don't really think of the implications down the road of your current extreme dependency on technology. When the technology eventually fails and you are utterly dependent upon it, and it can fail in any, any number of ways, um, <clears throat> or for any number of reasons, if you're addicted to that technology, you are in, in terms of brute survival, an inferior position to someone who is not addicted to it. Um, let's say that a hunter-gatherer, say, in, in the Arctic North, um, we've all read um, science fiction stories about that, about, uh, you know, say, the more technologically advanced situ civilization collapses. The people, the backward people living in the wilds don't even notice that it's happened but the entire civilization that is built around technology collapses because the technology was no longer um, supportable. <coughs> Excuse me, it was no longer supportable. And remember the, the, the entire thrust of doomsday science fiction in the late 1960s and early 1970s about what happens when the machine stops. There's even that story, when the machine stopped. Um, what do you do when um, technology fails in a way where you can't really react to it, but you're utterly dependent upon it. What can you do? Progress only looks pro looks like progress while you're in it and you're climbing. What if it fails? Um, and again, this was the great disorientation of the stock market crash of 1929. People simply assumed that things were going to go on improving forever. And then, due to a f an inherent flaw in the system itself, the whole thing collapsed. And look what happened. Um, that's almost a financial trap where you get used to the constant increase in wealth so you count on it, you work it into your plan and then when it doesn't happen your plan fails um, so we don't really know if 
there is a productive moral slash legal system or a superior or inferior one because you have to look at it within the in, uh, from uh, on the entire sweep of its own existence um, you could say Rome was a wonderful experiment why did Rome eventually fail Rome was superior to the barbarians perhaps but in what only in relative terms at one point in time was it superior because its weaknesses became apparent later on the, the weaknesses of empire the weaknesses of people just not really believing in something that they believe to be as eternal as the sky itself they just assumed Rome was eternal so no no one had to actually do anything to bolster it uh, and so it just sort of collapsed of its own what would you call it its own certainty and there are so many different arguments for why Rome or great empires collapse but they tend to always collapse <laughs> um, our civilization will why will that why why will our civilization collapse when it does I don't know I haven't got a clue could be ready to collapse right now it might not happen for a thousand years it will though in that time frame how can we talk of better or not so good civilizations I don't think we can um, he goes on, you emphasize that you do not conceive master or slave to be superior or inferior to each other. I never advocated slavery, by the way. Masters are not always masters over slaves. No, I'm not saying you did. I wanted to be clear on that. But superiority and inferiority in this hierarchical context simply refer, refers to relative, social, relative positions on the social, in the social system. Start again. You emphasize that you do not conceive master or slave to be superior or inferior to each other. I never advocated slavery, by the way. Masters are not always masters over slaves. But superiority and inferiority in this hierarchical context simply refers to relative positions in the social system. A private is inferior to a sergeant, a sergeant is inferior to a captain, etc. If the master is not superior to the slave, then the master is not the master. I completely disagree with that, by the way. If the slave is not inferior to the master, then the slave is not the slave. I completely disagree with that. Um, <clears throat> now, um, superior or inferior? How is a sergeant superior to a private? Well, if we just reduce both individuals to the uniforms they're wearing, and say that there's only their, their their existence is only that as sergeants or privates. Um, is it really is one superior to the other? Well, maybe we could say that if we say that the only purpose of human existence is to win battles, and that's and that winning battles is an end in itself. Then we might be able to say that a sergeant is inferior to a captain. But is the sergeant does the sergeant live an examined life? Maybe the the private lead leads an examined life and reads Nietzsche in his off time, and the, the sergeant goes out and gets drunk. Um, the uh, private has taken up uh, all kinds of ways to improve his mind and to improve his uh, sense of understanding of the world around him and his position in life, and he uh, guards his health and everything. The sergeant guzzles beer and smokes cigars and spends his nights in brothels and that sort of thing is he really is one really superior or inferior to the other because a sergeant is not just a sergeant he's a human being with everything else thrown in there all the other multiple and contradictory things um, that make up a human being you can't really compare the quality of human beings it's interesting the argument that Orwell is making is kind of a, a, a modern um, take on the classical discussion that took place between what we would roughly call the Democrats and the oligarchs. <clears throat> the oligarchs, the oligarchic party said that only the people who had a certain amount of property should have the vote, and the Democrats said everybody should have the vote. And these are the, you know, that's, they, they based it on their ideas of superior and inferior people. Um, it's an interesting um, refocusing on that very debate in the modern age. <clears throat> Finally, he says, the role of the master should not be sought for its own sake, and power is not an end in itself, but superior social roles exist in all market-driven systems because of innate differences in mental capacity. A lot in there. The role of the master should not be sought, I agree, it just happens to you. It's just the way that you 
your life tends to play itself out. Uh, power is not an end in itself. Well, power is an end in itself for an awful lot of people, and that's a huge flaw in the argument of any sort of hierarchy. People want power. People will do anything to get it. Anything. Um, and there's no one more ruthless than someone who's jumped up, right? Somebody who came up from the ranks and is now the field marshal. Um, the ancients put it even more starkly. There was no worse master than a former slave. Why? Because the slave knows what utter powerlessness is, and once he's got power, he will never relinquish it. People are flawed. We have that will to power. We have that desire to lord it over other people, whether we like it or not, whether that's a nice thing or not. Now, you heard me talking in the previous video about the virtues of a traditional aristocracy. Okay, I get it. That's, that's a, you know, how do you, how do you balance those two? between a true aristocrat and a phony aristocrat, um, a proper, classically trained, um, you know, completely molded aristocrat of the traditional sense versus the Donald Trump aristocrat, um, <clears throat> who is not exactly a polished human being and is over-specialized and really doesn't seem to understand human thinking, um, or at least the totality of human thinking. He's over-specialized in that he knows how to administer things. And good for him. I'm not saying that I, I kind of... I don't like Trump, but I don't see him as a disaster that a lot of other people think he is. Um, what I'm saying is superior social roles... If you're going to say a superior social role, it's going to have to be superior in all respects. This person is going to have... A, like in, in society, this person's position is going to be superior, if it's truly superior. Um, and, you know, I, easy to debunk. Um, I'm outclassed in every possible measure uh, by Donald Trump, but I bet he and I couldn't have this discussion because it would all go right over his head. Who's superior? Um, <clears throat> the less capable uh, need the help of the more capable. Okay. Now we're saying very specialized. The less capable of what? Maybe the less capable of fertilizing fields efficiently need the help of the more capable of doing that. But really, is my way of living actually, in an absolute sense, better than the other fellow's way of living? Because if, if, I'm, if I'm a modern farmer and I'm teaching a subsistence farmer how to work his farm the way my farm works... Um, <laughs> in that sense, I might be saying that, yes, I can help him, but my, I might import my, all my fertilizer from Chile or from who knows where, and I'm dependent on things that he's not because his fertilizer comes out of his cow. Um, so, you know, you sort of you have to think, in some contexts, the technological way of doing things is superior to the non-technological or the technologically backward view of doing things. But in terms of viability... Uh, and non-fragility, in terms of durability, I guess, um, the subsistence farmer uh, won't notice the big things that will ruin the modern technological um, um, LinkedIn type um, farmer who runs a, a high-tech farm that's um, linked into the entire world. The guy who just has a whole herd of cattle in you know, sub-Saharan Africa isn't dependent on all that stuff. His situation is more precarious in some ways, but less precarious in others. And these, the, the precariousness of all of this only becomes apparent if and when the transportation and communications infrastructures that the modern farmer relies upon um, fail. If those fail, then you see how the Maasai guy with his herd of cattle might have had actually, in the long term, a superior system than the modern factory farmer in the American West. Um, it may actually be better in terms of survivability and durability. Um, just closing off the U.S. borders would probably ruin half of America's farmers. Closing off the borders of, say, Kenya wouldn't probably affect the Maasai or, in fact, uh, affect a lot of subsistence farmers at all. Their, their entire world ha uh, consists of where their cattle are and the market town, and that's the end of it. They don't require anything from anywhere else. So, 
Superior and inferior, I, I'm not so sure about in absolute terms. I can say that if we accept certain contexts, yes, the modern industrial farm or the modern technological farm is absolutely superior because it produces more. The simple as that. That's the purpose of a farm is to produce stuff for people to consume, right? But it has disadvantages which only become apparent if other things, other circumstances surrounding it fail. The technological farm is only possible because of the elaborate web of technology, information, communication, and transportation that underpins it all. Um, and it's could be fatally dependent on it. If you've ever seen a civilization collapse inwardly like that, that's what happens. They've gotten used to the fact that things are like this and that they will stay like this, they assume that they will, and human conditions have a habit of changing. And we see what happens. <clears throat> you know, the, the over-specialized civilization that might be superior um, tends to sort of give way again to the traditional one. Uh, the old image of um, rude herdsmen herding their cattle in the Roman Forum comes to mind. Um, market-driven systems. We have a market-driven system. Okay, do, is there an end game to our civilization? We have a market-driven system. A market-driven system. Now, I'd like to see what what you mean by that. Um, is our system meant to, to accomplish something? I don't think our system is anywhere near as well thought out as we think it is. It's, it strikes me as our civilization is more or less on auto autopilot. <coughs> Excuse me. Cold. We have these basic ideas as to where civilization could go, should go, and we act on them, but we don't really think of where we're actually headed. We don't actually think of, is there a goal ahead of us? We don't actually think that, we don't actually consider whether or not we're going anywhere. We just think of our relative positions, right? We just think of, like in terms of human competition, we just, we just consider our relative positions when we're discussing superiority or inferiority. Um, I can say that the Western technological view of, or the, the, the lifestyle I've got is superior to someone else's. Um, but really, it's only superior in a relative sense, and it's only superior in, in terms of parameters that, that I've already placed on the overall discussion. Is it absolutely better? I don't know. Because, again, I don't think that progress is possible on the macro scale. Process, progress, rather. Progress is only possible in terms of human um, existence, the individual's existence in all of this. Um, it's... In, as an aside, it's interesting that I'm speaking to a Christian about this because it's... I would have thought that that would be pretty axiomatic for a Christian. That, you know, money and power and luxury and technology and everything don't really mean what... don't really make a human any better. Um, so I'm sort of left with uh, this open-ended view of human quality. I don't... As I, as I said, I don't believe in human equality. But I don't believe that we can actually grade people in terms of inequality either. I'm just saying that there's any number of different um, different ways to define all of these things. And you seem to think that's, that the durability or survivability of the whole thing is what matters. Okay, survivability in what context? Long term or short term? Or just a snapshot of right now? Um, and really, is, is the survival in, in a competition of our of our society or our species an end in itself? Is that all we are? Well, I've debated people who actually seem to think that, um, the circle surrounding um, in Mendham, and no, I don't believe that that's the end game of human civilization or human existence at all, period. Um, just getting through the day and ending up with more goods and comforts than you had at the beginning of the day really is no existence, if you ask me. Um, the role of the master should not be sought for its own sake and power is not an end in itself but superior social roles exist in all market driven systems because of innate differences in mental capacity innate differences, absolutely I agree but innate di differences in, in what way the subsistence farmer is also very different in other ways from my mind than, you know 
he's more different from me than just the way that he approaches technology. I rather suspect that his entire experience of reality is so utterly different than mine that we ha might even have difficulty making any comparisons at all, let alone an evaluation, um, placing value on the relative positions. <clears throat> you can say, okay, well, wait till the guy gets cancer. He's going to want to avail himself of all the technologies that the modern West has produced to get to cure him of his cancer, which he can't do before. I agree. Setting aside the idea that modernity creates cancer, which I don't know. Um, but, yes, I agree with that. But, again, does that really make something better just because somebody desires it? I don't think so. A lot of people desire all kinds of stuff that doesn't really make them any better. I, w I might desire tons of candy, but it's still going to destroy my health, or tons of alcohol, or tons of whatever. Um, there is such a thing as too much. The less capable need the help of the more capable. You point out correctly, okay, capable of what? Again, capable of what? Capable of producing more goods and services. Or producing a more a life more worth living. The two are not the same thing. Um, you pointed correctly that the role of the master is in some sense a servile one. The master has obligations to help those beneath him in his hierarchy. The sergeant's job is to make sure his privates get what they need, which does include direction. I understand the desire you, respect, you, you express to step outside the hierarchy and be an autonomous individual, but that means shirking the obligations and duties that come with being a person of great capacity. Society needs leaders because many people need help. You don't have to do um, all of that. You don't have to... I, I'm I, far be it for me. I live right in the thick of life. I have a wife and son. I have a job. I have a house. I have, you know, I'm I'm part of all of this, sort of. Um, I have a desire to step outside of it, but only in certain ways. I don't want to step outside of it in the, in the Ted Kaczynski sense, um, Unabomber, but <clears throat> I want to step outside of it in terms of my point of view of it all how seriously I take it all, how important I believe it all to be. I certainly don't believe that there are any oughts or shoulds out there. I don't think that I have any obligation to help anybody. I have duties, obligations that come to come with the choices that I've made in my life, i.e., I have chosen to procreate and have a wife. I have obligations to them because I have chosen to accept those obligations. But I don't have any obligations based upon some idea that because I'm, I've got a superior mind, which I don't think that I do, that I somehow have an obligation to everybody else to enlighten everybody else. I don't believe that one little bit. The only obligation that I think that I have to the larger society is to not be an absolute burden to it. That's all. I, I certainly don't have any obligation to my society to improve it. No. I, if I do then somebody's going to have to demonstrate that I have that obligation. Axiomatically, we, we always think that you do have the, the obligation to improve the, the world and leave it a little bit better than you know how you found it. That's nice. I want somebody to demonstrate that I have that obligation. This is a, this is a very large, almost mind-blowingly large discussion. And with the way that human thinking has developed in the last decade or so, we're going to be seeing an awful lot more of it. There are, you know, it, it, it devolves to things like Anders Breivik and um, people who are convinced that the demographic changes on, on our planet are absolutely a menace to us all. I'm saying they may be, they may not be. Let's look at this with clear heads. Let's look at this as rationally or as dispassionately as we can. Um, there's a certain degree of panic now in a lot of people's minds concerning the way the future is projected to be. Let's take the panic out and look at it and speak very frankly. Um, I'm not afraid to do that, and I hope that others aren't. Sorry for the length of the video, and sorry for the fact that I have a cold. Hmm.